This concludes our amazing opening uh, session. I want to uh, now start with the uh, academic program. And I want to invite uh, Professor Eli Talmor. Uh, let me give a short introduction to Eli, who is a, uh, ha wears many hats, is um, a professor of finance in London Business School, uh, an accomplished uh, academician, an accomplished investor, an accomplished uh, builder of institutions like ours. Eli is our chairman uh, and behind the scene uh, motivator. Um, he's the kind of guy when I'm not happy, I have to call him. So thank you for being there for me too. Um, Eli is also heading our um, history of venture strand. And let me tell you one thing about the history of venture. When we suggested history of venture, Pemi said, oh, why, why, why are you looking at the past? Well, what's, what's the point of looking at the past? Venture is going forward, etc." And in fact, I sort of agree with that because I think that personally, the future of venture is going to be very different from what we had in the past. Still, it is very, very interesting to look at the past and to see how the past have actually created what we have today. So the components of historical changes are very, very important. So we have conducted an extensive work to mark 160 events in this um, uh, hi of a history of venture. And in fact, all of you have received, show me the thing, all of you have received this in your packet as our gift to you. This is a good time to take a picture because in a second, something's going to happen. When you open this, <laughs> like this, this is the beginning. And what I always like to do is go like this. So you get this, right? So this is a 160 event that Eli meticulously <laughs> read every sentence here with our team. And this is a database that is available for understanding and generate insights. To some of the insights that we have, I want to invite Ellie to join us. Ellie, please. You just be mindful about the time. Take, take, take all of this. Uh, Sorry? Yeah. Do you want to pick or the, yeah. Is it good? Yes. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, good morning, all. When uh, Yesha suggests that I look and write an issue on the history of venture, I could not think about any other way but to pick up events and through the events to start to put some theme around it. As Yesha properly said, the reason to look at the past is that if you don't know where you are coming from, not sure that you know where you are going. And uh, one criticism that I got was, why did you stop at 100 years? Which is opposite to the point, don't look at the past at all. As economists, you used to run regressions. When you run regressions, you look you know, at some points and then to do the trajectory going farther. So you do need to look at the past. Rarely you go that long in economics, rarely. Um, but I took it seriously after the original study. And in the last few days, I decided to go back, um, to be exact, 2.4 million years. And, um, and to see, is there anything that I can learn from 2.4 million years minus 100 that can also shed light and be related to the conversation I'm going to run in a second. So this is largely drawn, uh, this is largely drawn from a book by Yuval Noah Harari, but not only. And essentially, as you can see, this is the history of humankind. Uh, the uh, human being uh, have been for 2.4 million, as I said, uh, the homo sapiens, as we know them, only 6% of that time, 
which is just a mere 150,000 years, about half that time since then, uh, something happened and a conscious uh, notion called cognitive emerged, okay? Basically saying people are ingenious, they are creative. And that comes back to the idea of venture and I will point out more of this. So the moment people are, are creative, they start to populate the plant and all the rest of the mammals start to disappear or to go into cages. Um, so that's 70,000 years ago. Jumping uh, fast forward, another major breakthrough is the agricultural revolution, where people change from being gatherers and, and hunters into farming. Uh, then came the scientific revolution with the Renaissance 500 years ago, names like Bernoulli, uh, to mention one, and you know, other mathematicians uh, later. Um, and halfway through that, the industrial revolution came. Uh, which triggered again a major change, uh, particularly in Europe, about the way people live. Fifty years ago, we got the information revolution, and now we are uh, at the beginning of a new one, that is the biotechno biotechnological revolution, uh, which, uh, uh, according to some people, uh, and Harari is one of them, but not only, Ray Kurzweil, the futurist of Google, is another one, actually calls for the end of the humankind the way we know it. Uh, and actually we'll get into, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, this is what is supposed to happen. But that's really the future. I'm, not, I'm here to talk about uh, the past. But at least, I don't know if this is good or bad, to be immortal and to, uh, to live forever as, as uh, some kind of, uh, some digital units. Uh, one thing you don't need to worry about is what Yesha said is the interpersonal of human people in the coffee shops. That probably will not be there anymore. Um, what I pick up from that, from reading a little bit about beyond the 100 years, which will be my focus, is man, uh, the importance of language. Language became very, very important. The ability to communicate in large groups beyond one or two birds talking to each other or having some signals, uh, going into large groups, is the ability to assess, assemble, assimilate uh, abstract matters and to make corporations in large teams. And again, that we see this cooperation very important when it comes to venture as well. One thing which I picked up, and for the life of me I don't understand that, is gossip. Apparently, humankind are the only ones who can gossip. I don't know how they know that, uh, and why it is so important, but so be it. Uh, and finally, and that's also a very important lesson to the remaining of my lecture, is the uh, importance of the ecosystem, which is basically uh, including the financials, monetary terms, uh, uh, money, credit, and the rise of capitalism. This has been a very important component uh, along that history, and it's funny because when we look at the zoom in on the last 100 years for our context, we'll see this uh, becoming very relevant. So as we move, am I in the right place? Yeah. So again, uh, uh, there are people maybe biased like Dyson, Professor uh, Physicist Freeman Dyson, who said that technology is the second most important uh, gift of God after life. Okay, because with technology we can generate civilizations, art, and science. Um, however, again, I'm jumping to the bottom here, is the other thing to me that is very important is the social fabric. And social fabric means, again, I mean, it's universities, it's institutions, it's banks, stock market, ability to raise funding, uh, government. Without government, we'll have no enforcement of law. Patents, that's all related to it. And without it, I don't know exactly what venture really uh, would mean and how would it be sustainable. Um, so that's by way of uh, preliminary uh, comments. Now, in terms of the study itself, as I said, the w easiest way for me is to focus on events uh, because I'm not historian by, by, uh, by background. Um, and uh, we took a very holistic view. And I'll just talk a, li a little bit about the methodology because it's quite important here. And then I'll pick up a few uh, specific events and focus on them. Uh, 
I think as, as, as the general counsel probably said, venture means many things to many people, okay? And maybe that's why it's a very diffusing term. And that's why I'm very happy with it for the Kohler Institute of Venture because really we would like to capture different angles at different points. Uh, but it does mean uncharted water, absolutely. It's, it's everything that got to do with some element of risk, okay, uncertainty. Uh, more in a positive way than in a negative way. Uh, well, in terms of, this is, has been the motivation I discussed in, in detail. In terms of uh, the focus, the unique aspect, unlike any other study on the history of technology or patents or whatever, is that we don't look just at innovations, outcomes, results, but we also look at drivers, okay? What are the, uh, really the influences? What is the ecosystem? What are the specific elements that actually were particularly major as enablers for these outcomes and innovations to happen? That's for us equally important. In some sense, I would say it's even more important because it, these are the ones you want to generate. The rest will probably follow, okay? Uh, so that's one point. Second is uh, the fact that, um, yeah, so we talk about this. The, uh, in terms of the, the, the period of time I already mentioned, uh, it's, it's, uh, we had to put some, some limits here. Uh, well, we decided to go with 100 years, again, just to have a limit, but we could do it in terms of the length of time. We could not do it in terms of the breadth. And the breadth of events that you'll see, is, is ver that you saw in that accordion, is very large. The original number was 147. Uh, I kept it like that, now it's 160, it probably will change. Um, and uh, as you can see here, there are, you know, split between uh, inputs and outputs, so to speak, between uh, uh, enablers and results. W I'll, I'll pick up a few of those, no need to uh, worry about uh, the details here. Um, it's an ongoing project, it's very subjective, of course, uh, and it's very dynamic. So. Um, the, uh, let's see, the one comment that I do wish to make is about the geography. And the geography um, clearly is, 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 you know, tilting to the U.S. and to the West. Now, that could be a bias. I don't think so, to be honest. I think that, yes, we are, you know, Western-oriented, uh, those people, me in particular, who were engaged in the study. I read English, I collect the data from there, I don't read uh, Asian languages, and, you know, there is a bias. Having said that, I think it's not a big surprise to see that the dominance of the U.S., and rest, after that coming the U.K., Germany, and the rest of Europe, uh, I think the reason is because of the role of the governments the role of the large platforms, NASA is one of them, okay, the Cold War, etc. they are very dominating elements and they gave rise to both large corporations and second is innovation of a major scale that I will talk about. So I don't think it's, it's just a bias. Uh, yes, there could be pockets. We try very hard, especially on Asia, to come up with stuff. Uh, so Temasek is the major program by Singapore has been identified as one. We have a few others. By all means, being here where we are, and I say it anywhere I go, you know, if you think we miss some major events that did uh, influence venture on a global sense, by all means, let us know uh, whether cyber uh, city will be one of them or not. I cannot include it yet, but somebody maybe well, you know, next generation, well decided, this is becoming one of those, who knows. Um, but, but definitely, this is again, changing the rest of the world so far is not very well represented. Japan is a bit, um, and it's all there. Anyway, um, that's in terms of the, the general statistics, and uh, let me just move. On the criteria, well, the criteria are, and this is for the discovery and for the innovation, First of all, clearly they, you know, we pick up events that are significant on their own merit. I pick up a few for medicine because then it's a kind of clear cut uh, IVF, in vitro fertilization, you know. 
was was considered to be to be uh, to be included. Uh, the corner stent was counted as major event. You know that's really saved people after heart attacks and so on and so forth. That's kind of important. Um, then there are the disruptive matters, and the disruptive could be, for instance, the the human genome or the DNA uh, finger uh, fingerprinting, etc. So these are not particularly solution to a problem, but something that is truly disruptive in in a major way. Um, and again, just happen to be in in medicine that I use these examples. Then there are the enablers and the platforms which are on top of what they are, are ac actually opening more doors and as a result they are multipliers in terms of the influence over there. To some extent the penicillin counts twice, it's such a huge thing because it's not only a uh, phenomenal uh, uh, you know, a, a problem uh, but a solver, but it's also really opening all the anti, uh, antibiotics uh, uh, line that took you know, the last almost 80 years uh, as a platform. Um, the last, which is the least trivi trivial one, is commercialization. For us, for me, it was very, very important to pick up innovations that actually uh, made a lot of impact on commercialization. And if I had to choose where was the event, the patent, the invention itself, or the commercialization, I picked up the commercialization. One example that I will discuss later in detail is Model T, Ford Model T, all right? Uh, which is the more important than the car itself, which is where, you know, the invention of the combustion engine and so on. Um, the other example that I will give here, uh, event that came, entered in the, almost the last minute, is on that ground only, is BASIC. You know, it's one computer language. Why would BASIC be here? I, I don't think I have C plus or COBOL. I mean, they're not there. The reason is because what BASIC did is to move programming from the hands of the programmers into the mob, okay, into everybody's life. So that was the language 50 years ago, almost exactly 51, two by now, that uh, actually uh, was used later on to for the for the. Uh, workstations and for the PCs and Microsoft uses to, to design uh, the, uh, the MS-DOS and HP and IBM. So all of these were based on, on, on BASIC and again for me this is, commer this is uh, commercialization. This is moving that on a major scale that all of us can use now laptops and PCs and not just go back, those of you who may remember, 40 years ago where you had to give it to somebody to program code in a university in some basement over there as I remember from my own times as a student in the engineering school. Uh, that's very important in terms of making an impact. Um, we, are, we are totally, and, 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 and last word about this commercialization, what's am I on the right page? Let's see, I moved already. Uh, is the fact that these are really the ones that make the tectonial shifts, okay? And again, the Model T, you'll see that in a minute. Uh, lastly, is regarding the, uh, where, which is actually the right place, uh, we have to be actually quite agnostic regarding where is the innovation coming, okay? Uh, in other words, it need not be from startups. In fact, most of the innovations came from large government schemes. Most of the money who ca which went to R&D came from governments. Uh, the big parks, technological parks, uh, <coughs> and the large corporations, and the large corporations. So lots, lots, lots comes from there uh, in terms of those who make the big impact, especially in, as some of them involve a tremendous amount of uh, resources to be produced. Um, all right. I discussed the commercialization biases. Biases are, are, are many. Uh, one is time, time distance. Clearly we know more about the last 20 years than we know about 80 years ago, okay? It's very difficult to know what really happened here. So clearly w the resolution is, exactly like in a camera, is much more resolution to the last 10 years. So for us, events that happened there in the last 10 years are viewed as important. Uh, and or the last 20 years, and it's, it's 
quite possible that many of them will disappear uh, as, you know, as unimportant, or the difference will be. So just one example, Oracle and SAP, okay? From today's point of time, they are maybe as two major corporations that do very different stuff. I'm pretty sure that in 50 years from now, if they still stay in the list, they may disappear, they will be viewed as one event, some kind of big data management in, in large organizations, that sort of enterprise systems. Um, again, things that are like the, and I'll come to that, the Sony Walkman, that was a big event some times ago, not viewed today as important at all, okay? And that's the nature of the bias that we have um, in terms of where the time we are. Of course, the other thing is that we have the challenge and a bit about, uh, and I'm going down here, uh, is about the, the new event that were just invented and we cannot judge whether they're important or not. I'll give you just a few examples. Uh, crowdfunding didn't get the list uh, because I didn't think it's important. I may be wrong. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the finding the, uh, the, the Higgs boson, you know, the, 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 the last element that was not known, the Higgs particle, I included it because everybody was so excited about it. I still don't know what you do with this. Uh, if any, and that may turn out to be just a fed, not very different from, from others. That, but, you know, I gave kudos to science and included it. What I did not include is the Bitcoin because it's too early to tell. I, you know, I think it's a fed. That's my opinion. Other things differently. Clearly paying a lot of money. Just jumped a few days ago, big time. Uh, certainly too early to tell. But that's the nature of the beast. You know, there is nothing to do about it. Uh, history should, should, uh, should judge. Um, in terms of omissions, well, let's talk about incrementality. Incrementality is a very interesting matter. There are lots of areas where discoveries are not major jumps. You know, when it comes to IT, not only that we are biased, IT against material science, for example, okay, that's, that's a major bias, at least for, I bet, most of the people in the room. Not Yael, but, uh, but uh, most, most of the others. So for us, the big names coming from Silicon Valley, we all know. We all know the Oracles, we all know the HPs, you know. When it comes to other stuff, well, it's very different when it comes to material, when it comes to other type of industries. So we had to work very hard and we had to judge, uh, and to, to trust the judge of other people. For example, the graphene discovered Okay, now it's more talking about because the idea, now people talk about graphene to replace the batteries. This is a solution to the, the car batteries, you know, in the, in the electrical cars, that this will be it. And, and, and using a lot of, uh, it's fantastic for sustainability because instead of all this, this acid uh, liquid, you are going to get just, just graphene and, and, and air. So graphene is more known. Uh, when we did the study, at least for me, graphene was not known. Uh, as much. The other one is float glass process. People tell me it's very, very important. I included it. They also got the Nobel, by the way. But the Nobel, getting the Nobel is, 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 was not a criteria. We did not go that way. We just looked at it independently. And if they got the Nobel, it's kind of assurance. Uh, so, you know, there are these, these uh, sort of, again, biases as to what we know and most of us and what we know less. Uh, again, the IT versus the, uh, the iPhones of the world and the Cisco's of the world and the Amazon, everybody familiar, almost becoming not interesting as when it comes to the material, uh, medicine, that's a different story. But I tell you one area where I found this particularly difficult, and that's the most mundane industries. The problem there is lack of uh, disruptive changes. The, there are changes, but they are very incremental. I'm talking about constructions, okay, materials, non-electrical engineering of all kinds, agricultural, processes, equipment, okay, home appliances. In all of these areas, it is extremely difficult to pinpoint a point of jump. And I tried hard. I tried really, uh, for instance, to get, being Israeli, to, to put Israel on the map, I was thinking about desalination. There was a guy named Zarkin who came with desalination, I thought, you know, he deserves credit. I could not give him the credit. The reason is that 
Desalination goes back to the times of the Romans. He did not discover anything big. Okay, I could not, he, and he's not listed there. It has been a very gradual change. I checked all the dams in the world, all the roads, all, you know, all of them to see has there been anything of, of major jump, building materials, construction, bridges. Could not identify one that is big enough as a change. Luckily enough that I uh, find out that with the air conditioning, which is very important for our life. You, we cannot imagine our life without air conditioning in, in most parts of the world, right? Let's not forget about this kind of stuff. Um, well, it was before the 100 years, so I couldn't include it, but the Freon was invented. And that, because uh, before the Freon, it was very explosive, so it was not allowed to be used. So that made the commercialization of it uh, of, of large scale, and that is included here. But this is a kind of very difficult. Uh, laundry machine and all of these are not. Um, Another one that I was very proud finding, finding that you usually, usually don't think about is the ATM machine. Again, try to think about our life as ATM without that, and, and credit. Um, subjectivity is the next issue, and the last one here. I'll just give you one example. When we did a study, CNBC came with their own study about the top, how many events they had? I think nine. 10, 10, 10. They had top 10 events in the last 105 years, for whatever reason, 105, I don't know. Nine of them came with, within our period of 100 years. Okay, now they have nine, we had 100, you know, 47 at that time. You would expect all these nines will be included, right? I mean, obviously, obviously, this is a top, top nine. Uh, the answer was that only four were included, which is weird. Five of them, we, I did not include. Even after I saw them, I didn't say, oh my God, I made a mistake. I did not include. I give you one example, the Concorde, you know, the jet. I didn't think it's important. They included it. Okay. The, the Sony Walkman, they included. I did not include. Um, so there is a bias. There is subjectivity. Nothing to do about. Uh, the one thing that is important, and I will emphasize later on, is the impact of global political uh, forces, particularly wars. Uh, the institutionalization that I mentioned before, generating the enterprise, the platforms for disruptive, they are very important. I mentioned NASA already, the Cold War that you know is behind NASA, Xerox Park and others, they are extremely important for deep innovation. Uh, it's not just the startups that uh, are there. Uh, I will also give kudos to the individuals with all, this, all the respect to the institutions. Still there are individuals and we should not forget the impact of the individuals. Uh, and finally is the multidisciplinary element, which is, you know, I was thinking this is a new phenomenon. Certainly universities f were not multidisciplinary for a long period of time, they became recently. I thought this is a new phenomenon until again I came back to the study of the two million years where I saw the language, and the language is b basically allow people to communicate. So from now on, I will uh, focus on, 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 on examples. So these are a few selected events, but even here within that list, let me pick up in the interest of time, just a few to, to one of, of, of a kind, all right? <coughs> um, how much time I have? Five no way. <laughs> no way. I'm your boss. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend. So that's 70. Okay. Whatever can t I can buy time. Uh, uh, okay, quickly then. Uh, Bell Labs. Bell Labs, I, I don't know. Who heard here? I will ask you several times. Who heard the name Bell Labs? N not from me. Oh, can't you did? Okay. Uh, it was put together jointly by AT&T and Western Electric. Uh, AT&T at that time was known by the name uh, Bell. Um, and it was a scientific center, primarily in New Jersey, where there were semi-academic, really a lot of scholars, researchers, hundreds of people, if not thousands of them. And it was truly multidisciplinary. 
And if you go through the list of innovations that came from there, it's just astonishing, right? You got the radio, astronomy, laser, transistor, uh, information theory, Unix operation uh, system, several programming languages, all you know, were developed there. Not, I'm not saying exclusively there, but the contribution there is, is, is just unbelievable uh, with a lot, a lot of home runs. Um, Anti-craft missiles, Apollo program, even many things, they, were, they really had a free hand to do whatever they want. I was interviewed, by the way, for Bell Lab, and they told me when I was in the job market after my PhD uh, in the United States, and, you know, the interview there was, you can do whatever you want. You don't need to teach. You just sit there, you just think about, you can cooperate with other people or not, it's up to you. Um, and the funny part is that the reason for that, why did they have the Bell Lab? The reason is that at and at that time was a monopoly. As a monopoly, they had to pay back to society. One way they decided to do that is through establishing this uh, sort of research park for humankind. And basically, again, the, the, the results were absolutely phenomenal. Seven Nobel Prizes came out of, of that, uh, awarded for people who did the work uh, over there. And again, I emphasize the interdisciplinary. Uh, second example is uh, now time for individual. Now, before I go here, let me just go back a second. Uh, the People associate the biggest name in the history of Silicon Valley is William Shockley, Bill Shockley, who is the Shockley Laboratories. And if you, those of you who remember from the stories of the Valley, uh, you know, there are the, there are the Fair, Fairchild, these are people who left the Shockley Laboratories, they were unhappy there, and they known as the Treacher Eight, who actually uh, left, and they include Gordon Moore, who then established uh, Intel and behind the uh, Moore Law, and, uh, and uh, uh, Kleiner, Eugene Kleiner, who was one of the founders of Kleiner Perkins, of course, et cetera, et cetera, and six more. Now, uh, you know, God help me, the guy is dead, but the truth has to be said. Bill Shockley got nothing to do with the spirit of the value and entrepreneurship. He's ingenious, no doubt about that, you know, in inventing of semiconductors and whatever, but he was paranoid, he didn't know how to manage people, he did not know how to deal with people, his children did not know that he died until a few weeks after that, uh, you know, except for his wife, nobody attended the, the, the funeral. Terrible man in, in comes to, to interpersonal skills. Again, junior, uh, genius, that's separate. Well, so there is nothing between him as a character and the spirit of the valley as we all know it to be and what it's supposed to be. So who is the hero? And the hero is an unsung hero. This is the man, Fred Terman. Anybody heard the name Fred Terman? Three. Well, that's, I discount you and I discount you, so maybe one. Um, <coughs> Fred Terman was the dean of engineering at Stanford. And uh, he identified that university is n beyond just uh, a, a place of education. And essentially, first of all, he placed uh, HP, two of his postdoctoral students, uh, Hewlett and Packard, uh, they were his students, and he proposed that they will establish the company nearby Stanford, which was a major revolutionary uh, thing to do. And then after that, he started recruiting more and more companies into this sort of campus, into this uh, industrial park that he established there, all right? Uh, and that included uh, Varian, that was uh, the first one. Uh, I mentioned HP, Eastman Kodak, uh, General Electric, uh, Lockheed, and, you know, and these are large corporations, so you can see this is not necessarily startups. Uh, this guy is the single-hand man behind the success of the Silicon Valley for all what it means to, to the United States and to the world of venture as a whole, okay? He is really the architect of that. He is the one who converted the whole area around Stanford from being orchards into a community. Because on top of moving the companies there, he understood that people need to also live there. So he talked to the real estate 
uh, moguls of the area to start developing neighborhoods there. He talked to Stanford to release land for that purpose and to the farmers. And following the houses, he again he, uh, came with the concept of the uh, that there need to be shopping centers over there and a variety of other services. So this becomes really a peninsula, a hotbed for innovation, okay? And the model of cluster as we know it uh, since then. And again, uh, very modest one individual uh, that came with all of these uh, concepts. So there are individuals as well, not just governments, not just uh, technology per se. Um, Again, because of the interest of time, I will just skip all the way to the, to the last one, and that's the hippie movement. And uh, I'll explain why I pick. You see, I pick up a lot of, again, uh, social and uh, ecosystems elements uh, that are drivers and enablers. Now, let me explain this one, because here the three, I, you know, I don't think anybody did before the, the, the connection. Um, it's kind of interesting to talk about, after the fair children, from fair child, to talk about the flower children. Uh, which we have here. So what happened here? Put yourself in time to the early 60s. We are here uh, post-traumatic time in the United States where uh, JF Kennedy was assassinated. They are in a starting now to get more and more into the mess of Vietnam. We have the crisis missiles with the Russians, with, 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 uh, with uh, uh, Cuba, all of these problems going on there. And there is a lot of distrust to politicians. Okay. Uh, people start to avoid uh, going to the being drafted, and instead they went and continued education beyond undergraduate into graduate and PhDs, okay? It was done deliberately to avoid and in, in resenting politicians and, and big governments. Uh, so we started to see much more liberal views among the youth in America, uh, and, uh, and uh, certainly later on in the world, or in parallel from other places, and we, parallel to that, we saw also in the UK and elsewhere, uh, you, know, you know, in the 60s, uh, this period of the Beatles, uh, free love, pop, uh, LSD, all kind of stuff was going around, and the hippie movement came particularly in, in, in San Francisco, as you know. Um, well, think about it. Uh, that's not a coincidence that the hippie movement was concentrated in, around Berkeley, and in San Francisco, and the Silicon Valley happened to be in the same neighborhood, more or less. It is not a coincidence. Because what that period of the free love, hippie, you name it, uh, of the late 60s did is to open up people. That the, you know, more is allowed. And one of the things that is allowed is not only to, uh, um, to be dressed, not, not to shave, let's call it this way, let's keep it modest, or to dress in a strange, colorful, uh, or in, 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 in to, to play strange music, but also not to work for Lockheed, not to, lo to work for the large corporations. People are allowed to be what they are, to be creative, and to be individuals, individualistic, and to stay, work at home, you know, cherish lifestyle. So we saw a lot, a lot of startups in the valley at the same time that were there, again, there was much more free spirit, the spirit of entrepreneurship, and again, it was primarily the, the valley. And many of them are eccentric people, you know, they don't fit into the large corporate world. All of a sudden, they were flourishing, working on their own. As last anecdote here, I would just say, well, one minute, uh, is the fact of the Zen movement in California. And uh, this is related to, again, the attitude that was about embracing the foreigner. America has been fantastic all, all throughout its, its, its livelihood to embrace uh, immigrants. But there always was the melting pot to make them Americans. This changed. It changed with George Harrison playing, you know, the sitar and being a student there of Ravi Shankar. It's planned with the Zen, uh, the Japanese, you know, sort of, religious cultures affecting California, and it means that the foreigners are, and I'm talking specifically about now the Asia, uh, Far East, is also are embraced with their own culture. So it's not only t having them and make them look like us, you know, or behave like us, but also that bring values that we don't have. This openness is absolutely related to the spirit of entrepreneurship. And I finish 
with, um, I don't have time to talk about the birth of the computer, which is a fascinating, fascinating story. Which one is the first, which one is not? You know, four competitors for that. I can speak about that enough for, for time. But I'll talk about the ENIAC. That's probably the, the, the one that is the most capable, the bigger of general use, that is, is uh, the, the first full-fledged computer. And it was so big, I have here, I think, the statistics, is, uh, you know, 17,000 vacuum tubes, um, 70,000 resi resistors, and the list goes on and on. Um, five million hand soldier joints, 27 tons. The rumors are that when it was lit, the lights in, in, in Philadelphia were dimmed mm -hmm. because of the amazing amount of electricity at that time it was consumed. So that's a gigantic thing. Well, and here I'm finishing with a question to you guys. Who were the first computers? Now, those of you who heard me before, don't say. The human beings. Any particular type of human beings? <laughs> Female. These are the first computers. And the reason is as follows. The, during the war, okay, it was developed during the war, Second World War, and it was, they recruited primarily female to that, scientists, graduate students in physics, in, in, in mathematics, and elsewhere, uh, clearly because the boys were sent to the front, the bias here was that 90% of them were actually female, very few male. So really, this first computer were handed in, 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 in a very solid hands of very smart female. And they were called computers because, you know, that's the way in English. You say gardener, and you say engineer, and you say computer. They were computing. So I will stop on this uh, point. Sorry. Thank you very much, um, uh, Eli. Of course, you have to understand that we have many, many, many more stories. Uh, and all of you, I remind you, got this here as a gift. This is the 160 events. When we started this, we said, on one hand, we will collect the 160 event. And on the other hand, we will look for historical perspective on various hot topics. One of them was venture capital, one of them was corporate capital, and yet another one was on China. What happened in China in venture in the last years? So I asked a good friend of mine, find me the best expert in China venture. He said, fine, let me work on that. A week later I got a call, I got you the best expert, and that's how I got to know Manny here, right? So without do, I want to, um, Manny wrote for us a, on this special issue, uh, a special paper on the history of venture capital in China. And by the way, for all of you, in the break, you will be able to get a copy of this over there at our special desk. Manny, please join us to give us a comment on the history of venture. Thank you, Professor Yesha. Um, I want to talk about my impression of Ali's uh, study and this uh, marvelous study. <laughs> or um, I have to say, uh, to read it, I spent quite some time to read it, um, to digest it. And for me, especially, I have to look at dictionaries to <laughs> translate some of the words into Chinese. Um, is a, um, it's not a, a study of looking at venture in history, I would say. It's a, from a quite different perspective. It's like a river of thought to me. Because um, as he put it, every entry, if you look at it behind, it's a fantastic story, and more than a story. <laughs> so that sometimes I have to read and I have to do some research. It's a mind-opening uh, learning experiences for me. So I really appreciate your uh, piece. Um, and um, Professor Yesha asked me to comment on uh, if uh, 
in, if the history repeats itself or some event, it can never repeat itself. And I look at this 100 years history, um, and then I said to myself, gee, I can never imagine that I would live in that type of per period of time, like 100 years ago. And then you start to think, what about next 100 years? And I, I don't think I can live even though you said as a, a model, whatever, <laughs> to that far. But my children, you know, my granddaughter just was just born, and they may have the experience to go that far. And you couldn't really imagine what the word that would be. Fantastic word, I would say. Uh, to say that the history if repeat itself, my conclusion is it can never repeat itself in the same time uh, context because Professor Ellis really put every event into a big context of political, environmental, social events, right? So I don't think so, but there are similar things. So when you look at history, you said, gee, similar things happen, but in a different environment have a different uh, impact. For instance, you, uh, you mentioned one of the events is 1946 to 1964, the baby boom, right? And that really have a big impact later for uh, economic, uh, you know, labor supply or demand, consumer demand. The same thing happened similar to China, but a different event, different period, <coughs> and different causes, different impact, I would say. That was uh, between 1962 to 1971, also about 10 years period of time. And a uh, different reason, because 1960s and 1961, um, China experienced a, a big f uh, fa famine. It's not only that, it's political system and things like that. A lot of people died of hungry, my own relatives, I, I heard. Uh, so people had very, very hard time. And after 1961, people have a little bit better life, and also bec because of politics, uh, policy, I would say, to encourage people to have more children. For instance, in, in the countryside, everybody is working, was working in a commune, right? You work together, and then you get grab, uh, crops, and you distribute after you pay the tax. Okay, then Thai policy was per capita. Like if you have 100, not 100, maybe 50 kilo of corn every year per capita. So if you have a little baby just born, 50 kilo, I mean a uh, kilogram. And then if you have an adult labor, the same amount. So people were encouraged to produce a lot of children. Um, they produce like 10, 11, 12 children. Those 10 years, China, I think, had a new population, new birth babies were about 200 million. And to say that, it later helped uh, the tremendous economic growth uh, based on this labor supply, unlimited labor supply during that period of time. And that's why it came out. One uh, child policy, and right now, you know, even they started, try to start, you can have, okay, you can have two, but my student, no one want to have two. They, they believe it's just too costly, and they have their own life. So, but life a little bit similar in that pattern. But something I, I would think that um, the Chinese Asian philosophy, it, you know, I think is very smart, because Good things can turn bad, and bad things can turn good. Uh, for instance, you mentioned this, um, you know, an, an intended gift by Hitler, so that released a lot of Jewish scientists helped the boom of scientific research in the United States and UK. I believe that because things are bad, you know, for instance, in China, the Cultural Revolution was bad, but people realized that, that this power of of you know, trying to get a better life, this entrepreneurship released from this after cultural revolution environment. 
And also, that's why the Chinese Asian philosopher believe they put, I don't know if you read this, um, you know, the book of change. If you look at the book of change, they never put the best, the uh, optimal or the desired state as the best state. It always the second to the best. Because if you are at the best and the, you're at the top of the mountain, the next step, there's nowhere to go. You have to go down. Right. So if you look at the history, it's, yes, we are imp improve ourselves life, but it's it's not straightforward. It's three step forward, two step backward. You know, two, one step forward, maybe two step backward. But this a hundred years is always you know moving forward. Uh, for instance, I look at your entry. There is a uh, penicillin uh, dis discover and and saved a lot of lives. But I know the current so-called the hot topic in uh, medicine is the other way around. Is a so-called uh, microbiome. <coughs> it's because you want to look at ways that to try to avoid antibiotics and antibodies because it is it's everywhere. It's in your body. It's in your food. It's in the soil. It's in the water. It's in the air. So it really affects your life. So the, the other way around, you see, is another move. And that make our life uh, a lot better, I think. So um, that's my very simple <laughs> summary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you. Thank you Manny. Um, I want to welcome you all to our first coffee break. This is a short break, just to have coffee. <laughs> Then we have a very long lunch to schmooze around, take pictures, exchange business cards, etc. So we'll call you and we'll call you. Please be on time. Thank you very much. You have uh, 15 minutes. Thank you. It's right here. Very short. Very short. <laughs>